a couple of things. You know, I I kind of like, even though I start class and get a little flustered and want to get into the material, but you know, this past week is the anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King. And it should be remembered that the assassin is from Missouri. And as a matter of fact, James Earl Ray is from Little Dixie, so that's a little bit north and east of here around the Alta, Oregon, mm -hmm. Illinois. And, you know, it occurred to me, for me, that's not, you know, something you read about in history books. I was around during them. I mean, that was just a terrible season of life with the first, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And, you know, that was quite a shock that something like that would happen. And immediately the Warren Commission did its investigation and then locked everything up and said, we're not releasing our report for 50 years. And after that, Malcolm X was assassinated. And you know, strangely in that situation, there seems to be some evidence that the New York police and the FBI were complicit in that to some extent. And then Martin Luther King was assassinated after that. And then after that, Bobby Kennedy. And as I was looking at the book for this course, you know, we talk a lot about conspiracy theories. And if you also look at the popular media, there's an awful lot of chatter about how benighted people are to believe in Q, QAnon things. And one of the themes that stands out for me across that horrible season of assassinations in American society is that conspiracy theories abounded. In JFK, there was all of this mysterious people on the grassy knoll. And with Martin Luther King's assassination, actually the family of Martin Luther King talked with James Earl Ray. Jesse Jackson talked with the assassin. They were convinced he was not a racist. They didn't think he did it. There was this mysterious figure called Raul, perhaps, who was involved in this. Maybe it was the mafia that was involved in his killing. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Coretta Scott King won a lawsuit basically in service of making the case that James Earl Ray was not the assassin. And he maintained his innocence until he died. But you know, the weight of evidence is that Ray did do it. And Ray was a racist. And during his time that he was in Missouri, he was friends with a German chap by the name of Sturm who testified that, yeah, this, this guy did not like black people. And he enrolled in the military to be stationed in Germany to learn more about Adolf Hitler. And, you know, unfortunately or fortunately when he was there, he ran afoul of the US military, he went AWOL. Um, and even while he was in prison for other things, he escaped. People also said, well, he couldn't have done it because you'd have to make a really difficult shot given the, the length of the distance. But you know that neglects the fact that this gentleman was a marksman in the army. We tend, you know, and I, I kind of do that not to just be an old person and reminiscing about that, but we tend to not believe that very banal, stupid people can do things that will have a dramatic effect on our history. It was hard to believe that Oswald did what he did in killing JFK. And when Robert Fitzgerald Kennedy was assassinated, the family still believed, you know, there's no way that Sirhan Sirhan could have done it. Because, yeah, that's true. That, you know, we just don't want to believe the banal, but it does tend to happen. You know, I, it, it puts a human face on these conspiracy theories. And I, I struggle very hard <laughs> to deal with people who I know who believe in like QAnon things. It's like, what, what, what possesses you? But these come from very real needs. I think. Uh, and, and, and even while Ray was, yeah, Ray, escaped from Jet City. Ray also escaped for a while from his imprisonment uh, 
after he killed King too, and, and was recaptured. So this, this was a very resourceful gentleman. But okay, um, it occurred to me that maybe it would be kind of instructive to talk a little bit more about the cross leg panel associations thing. So let me come back into the screen and show you one of the papers that I was involved with. I thought this might be kind of fun to look at given your chapter uh, for a couple of reasons. This is because it's Missouri data that we've done here. Oh, where do you see it? Uh, and it's in the Journal of Abnormal Psychology, which is a fairly good journal for psychology. Um, and basically, what I wanted to do was to talk to you a little bit about, at that time, this is like now, good heavens, 20 years ago, when it was news to people that you would not necessarily look at alcohol use disorders and tobacco disorders here in the traditional cross-leg panel association. And this is a little, maybe a little bit nicer of a picture than what's in your book because it underlines the fact that we've got all of the things in the model, the correlations within measurement occasion, the autoregressive paths, and the cross-leg paths. And the gist of this particular article was what I was telling you last time, that rather than look at these associations, it's possible to think about alcohol use disorder as a trait, as a stable thing. Maybe you're a person who just has alcohol use disorder and it's stable across your life. And similarly, tobacco is a very, very addictive substance. It's very hard to come away from tobacco uh, once you've started it. And that's a really sad thing at Missouri because there is a difference by sex in Missouri that men tend not to take up smoking while they're in college, but women do. And often the stated reason for these people is that they began smoking because they thought it was a really great weight loss technique that they noticed that they, you know, if they stopped smoking, they would gain a lot of weight. And the gist of the claim in a state trait model is that all of the association between alcohol use disorder and tobacco disorder can be expressed by this double-headed arrow here, this correlation between one trait and another trait. And I won't go in too much into the weeds on this because it's maybe not exactly what you're interested in, but you know, we, we looked at those data in terms of diagnoses and also looked at a number of variables that were childhood stressors. And then we did our correlations on that. And I believe later on down here, we actually talk about how these uh, predictors relate to alcohol use disorder and within the state trait model. And down here you see, oh, we've got our cross-lagged associations that are talked about in the book alcohol use disorder is a pretty stable thing. And tobacco use disorder is more stable. You know, these paths from year three to year four, year four to year five, these are standardized coefficients. Those are relatively large associations. And, you know, if we were to interpret this the way that you talk about it in the Morling book, this would say alcohol use disorder is in many cases causing tobacco use you know, from year one to year two and year four to year five. Sometimes there's a little bit of evidence for tobacco use disorder causing alcohol use disorder within these later years. So I mean, this particular data set, we tested people at the four years of college and then got a grant to test people after college. So if you were to use the techniques that your book talks about, we would say when people start out college, alcohol is leading people down the road to smoking tobacco. And after they leave college, tobacco use disorder seems to be associated with alcohol use disorder later on. The larger picture, though, is that 
we have our trait upstairs here and our trait downstairs here. These two factors, you know, we use some technique called factor analysis, are associated. And once we take into account the fact that there's just a general association that those people who tend to have an alcohol use disorder in their life, and those people who tend to have a tobacco disorder in their life, tend to be correlated, these cross light associations no longer exist. You know, instead of being significant, now it's 0 0.02. So, you know, I was just thinking that that might be kind of a nice example. It's Missouri and it's college students, which are you folks. And it's a concrete example of what I was talking about last time. All right. So what I'd like to do is to come back and talk a little bit more about our PowerPoint for the past chapter. For your information, uh, I, I wrote up the learning objectives for chapter nine and put that in the syllabus. And I put the PowerPoint for chapter 10 up on uh, the Google Drive and also put the learning objectives in for chapter 10. And we'll get to that when we get to it. I mean, I think that we might need to be a little bit flexible in covering all the material in chapter 10. I'm going to rely on you folks asking me some questions uh, along the way, you know, just to know if we need to speed things up or slow them down a bit. As a matter of fact, I'll make sure my chat bar is open. So in case people type things, I'll see it right away. So in terms of this particular chapter, there's two words that get mentioned a lot, and I want to put a marker down on that so that as we talk about this, you keep in mind that there are these two terms that may mean different, very different things, mediation and moderation. And last time I talked in some literary generalities about the fact that in mediation, we're looking at explaining an association between one variable and another. And in moderation, which we'll talk about later in the slide, we're talking about the fact that an association is different between two variables is different depending on some other variable. So if I say sex moderates the relationship between amount of deep talk and well-being, I mean that for men, the relationship between amount of deep talk and well-being is different than it is for women. Mediation means that I can explain the association between the amount of deep talk that a person has and their well-being by means of this other variable here in the middle. So if I didn't have this quality of social ties variable in the model, I might think that there's a really big association between deep talk and well-being. One way to think about this is in terms of correlations. If I didn't have quality of social ties in the model, and I had this little path diagram going on, that letter C, that would represent the correlation between amount of deep talk and well-being. And now if I come back and I add in this quality of social ties variable, the correlation between amount of deep talk and well-being is going to be this path plus A times B. And this has something to do with something called the tracing rules in path analysis. And in graduate school, I teach a class on this. But it's interesting to me that in this book, these types of diagrams are something that you know, they're, they're really focusing on. Um, but they don't often talk about what the connection is between these diagrams and just a correlation coefficient. All right. Now, third variables associate are, are a way of understanding a 
relationship between deep talk and well-being in this case by means of a third variable. So if I were to put in a little double-headed arrow here, if I might want to say there's a correlation between deep talk and well-being, and I didn't have education level in the model, again, this correlation would just be what, what this path is. But if I have education level as a third variable explanation, the correlation between deep talk and well-being is going to be this correlation plus whatever the number is associated with this path and whatever the number is associated with this path. So mediation and third variable explanations are both very similar in that they're trying to explain away a correlation by reference to another variable. And the thing is, is the mathematical model for that is just a little bit different. In the case of education level, I'm thinking, well, there's a reason why I observe this correlation. And really, if I would control for education level, maybe this correlation would be greatly reduced or even go away. And in the case of mediation, I'm saying, oh, well, there's this intervening variable that explains how I can predict well-being from a lot of deep talk. So in terms of you know, to kind of underline it again, yes, they both involve multivariate studies. They've got more than two variables. And the answer to the question that I want to ask is, is there an association between two variables? In the case of mediation, I'm saying that there's a step in the middle. There's an intervening variable that explains the association. In the case of third variable associations, such as what you're looking at here, it's saying, well, really, there's, a, there's another variable out there that accounts for all of this association that I'm seeing. So you can kind of think of them as very closely aligned, but there's just a little bit of a difference in terms of the diagram that we're looking at. So if we come back here and now introduce that second term of moderation, Moderation is the identification of a differential relationship as a function of who people are in terms of you know, what you've had in your previous statistics course. When we talk about moderation effects between two variables, we're talking about a statistical interaction. Mediators are you know, a given causal model. But I think this causes that, causes something else. And maybe we can try to make this a little bit larger for you. This is the diagram that you see in the book. So in terms of mediation, we might start thinking that A is related to B. But if we think about another variable, maybe this association between A and B is actually accounted for by this causal chain that A causes C and C in turn causes B. So if we're looking at mediation, maybe if you just looked at watching violent television and aggressive behavior, you say, oh, there's, there's an association there. And you might wonder, well, why is that association there? perhaps becoming sensitized to violence, it desensitized to violence is the reason why there's an association between TV watching and aggressive behavior. So you would include that variable and you know, that causal chain from watching TV to being desensitized to actually acting on it is a plausible scenario to understand the process that's involved. <clears throat> Moderation, by contrast, is saying, well, if I look at just the data, I have an association between A and B, between, say, watching TV and aggressive behavior. But 
the magnitude of this association might be different for some types of people than for other types of people. So in this particular case, if I want to say the relationship between viewing TV and aggressive behavior is moderated by whether the parents talk with the kids about what this TV content is about. For if I, for example, do an experiment and have parents talk about TV content and not have them talk about it, I might observe that the association between watching violence and acting on it is very low if the parents talk with the kids about the TV program. And on the other hand, there's a stronger association if they don't. <clears throat> so you know, that 0.1 correlation versus 0.35 correlation is a moderated effect. And over here in our third variable association, we might say, oh yeah, there's a relationship between A and B, just as with mediation. But I'm going to say there's one variable out there that explains that entire association. So having lenient parents, for example, might be a third variable explanation for <clears throat> children both watching violent TV and behaving aggressively. So there's nothing inherently aggression producing about watching TV, it's the case that very lax parents tend to both raise children who are aggressive and also let their kids watch violent TV. Is that working for you? So this is you know, the point in the class where you're getting these words and these types of things ought to be on your flashcards, mediation, moderation, third variable explanations, multiple regressions, that type of thing. It's worth noting, by the way, if we come back upstairs and look at our mediation model, that these numbers here, B and C, are going to correspond to the regression weights that you would have if you just did a multiple regression. So sometimes people say, oh, well, I've got this causal diagram going on here. Maybe B and C are just going to be incredibly different depending on whether I assume a causal relationship here or whether I just say, oh, these two variables are correlated. And that actually makes no difference. Is that working for you? So, you know, if you're thinking about activities toward a test, if I tell you a research scenario and I say, and the researcher found that the correlation was this for this type of person and that for another type of person, you know that's a moderator effect versus mediation where I'm saying all of this association is due to another variable that I'm including. What figure is that? Figure 914 in the book on page. On page 266. Thank you, Grace. And you know, if you want, you can download the PowerPoint and sort of blow it up on your screen to make it a little bit bigger. I know that people are kind of looking at this on various devices. So now to connect what we've talked about in previous chapters with what we're talking about here. Multivariate designs are 
nice because they increase the internal validity of what we're looking at. There were some people in psychology, as a matter of fact, I reviewed a couple of books where they said, well, really, all you should ever do is, is bivariate studies, because if you have two variables, then you can slowly build up a theory. And that's not true, that one of the advantages of multivariate designs is that anytime we look at an association inside of psychology, there could be a variety of reasons why that association exists. So you kind of have to think of yourself as a lawyer, thinking about alternative explanations for what's going on. And in the case of cross-sectional works, where you simply go out and assess a population, that validity is perhaps in some situations problematic because you don't know what the characteristics of the population are. For example, uh, a few years ago, I worked with a professor in our department, Lynn Cooper, and she studied risky sex. And one of her studies was psychological distress and the decision of women to seek an abortion. And you know, there's a lot of reasons why you might find an association between the decision to have an abortion or not and going into a women's health center because the people who go into women's health centers generally do not have life insurance. They are generally poorer. And you know, one of the nice things about Lynn's study was that she had data gathered from women who both did and did not decide to have an abortion. And she found that really there is no difference. As a matter of fact, the American Psychological Association's policy on the psychological effects of abortion is that there are none. And that's based on an awful lot of research. Uh, and that's a little bit different than what you might hear in the media. So for example, I testified, you know, was it three months ago in Kansas on their proposed abortion laws? Uh, and you know, the witnesses for restrictions on abortion had many stories of, you know, it's what we in psychology call man who, or in this case, woman who statistics, it's women would come forward and say, here's my life story of why this was not right for me. <clears throat> but there's no testimony there from you know, the experiment. Uh, it was kind of a, you know, a good example of a flawed experimental design if you only have people from one side talking about this. And I know that several of you probably have different views on the advisability of women's reproductive health choices, but you know, the data are the data. Uh, and good experimental designs will hopefully inform these policy decisions. Construct validity is also really nice within a multivariate study because this helps us to differentiate what there is about a variable that's unique and what the overlap is with other things. So your convergent and discriminant validity are also capable of examination inside of a multivariate study. External validity, how we can then generalize to a population is also somewhat relevant. External validity identifies perhaps those factors that are perhaps unique. So one of the things that you know my daughter is very much exercised about being a graduate student is the extent to which women are underrepresented in a lot of scientific studies, mainly because in the pharmaceutical industry, in animal studies, focus is first and foremost on males because of the hormonal cycle that women have in and, and female animals have, and that, you know, that those hormone differences start to produce larger error variance inside your models just because of regular cycles that happen. So for 
statistical power purposes, they look at organisms that seem to be the same over the course of time. And for that reason, you know, have more precise estimates of how the physiology is changing. But for some pretty obvious reasons, that's not a really great idea because what about moderator effects? What about the possibility that pharmaceuticals could be hugely different for women than they are for men? Um, back down here. In this particular example, they're talking about evaluating a particular study of pregnancy and pregnancy risk as a function of TV shows. So, you know, low, medium, and high viewing are, are three bars that are here, and the ages are represented over here. The confidence intervals associated with those bars are shown in the diagram. And we can see there's a pretty clear gradient here between the amount of viewing that's going on and the chance of pregnancy at follow-up. Um, statistical validity, I guess, being the one that's easiest for me to understand given what I look at. You're looking at the magnitude of the effect, and you're also looking at the error bars, that is, how much measurement error was involved in the assessment. Okay. So when in the learning objectives for the chapter, they're talking about multivariate designs and how to evaluate them, I mean, we need to talk about what these four validities are in your discussion of a particular study. Okay. So thus far, this chapter, do you have questions about the terms? If I were to go over to the syllabus and we come downstairs and look at chapter nine, let me make this a little larger. And I'm hoping that you're all seeing the syllabus here. So why can't you just look at a correlation and no causation? Well, now you have a few new tools in your discussion. At the very beginning, we just said, well, there's a correlation here. We don't know if this causes that or if it's the other way around. But now you can say maybe the correlation is not a causation because there are other variables that mediate this effect or there are other third variables that explain the association between two variables. And if we're looking at longitudinal correlation designs, <clears throat> Granger causality, that is, we can think about some temporal precedence here. I'm hoping that by telling you folks also about state trait models, that there's a little bit of a healthy skepticism about whether the cross-leg cross panel design that the book talks about necessarily tests for temporal precedence. <clears throat> and we've talked about multiple regression analysis to give diagrams and the pattern and parsimony of candidate explanations helps us identify what might be a better theory from what might be a poorer theory. Um, and you know, what mediation is and what statistical significance of a regression means. And we talked last time about how to interpret an unstandardized or a standardized regression link. So those are the general ones. And if we come downstairs, we talk about longitudinal designs. How are they conducted? Here are some terms, cross-sectional auto and cross-leg correlations we talked about last time. And, you know, as I said before, what are we looking at in terms of cross legged associations and how our state trait models a little bit different? 
what are multiple regression designs, you know, cross-sectional ones for just more than two variables. And when you're looking at a multiple regression model, what's the dependent variable? That is, what's being predicted, what's the criterion, and what's the independent or predictor variable? And if we give you data from a multiple regression table, can you tell me what these coefficients mean? And when we look at experiments, that is, when we can assign people to condition, why is that maybe a little better than doing an observational study that looks at just multiple regression? And we talked about the pattern and parsimony criteria for thinking about what makes a theory better or worse. And as we talked about last time, often journalists want to report on the latest new study and get the news out about that, but they don't often consider the larger research uh, model involved and talk about mediation and what those relationships look like and tell me what the differences are between those three variables. So is that good? Well, we have a few minutes to open up some of the box of chapter 10, unless you have some questions about this. Chapter 10 is kind of a nice study, and a nice part of the class, mainly because it's going to tie in some of the things that we had before. And you know, some of the terms are going to be fairly familiar. And it's extended to the case of a given issue about doing a simple experiment. Well, I provided the link to chapter 10. Early on. And, you know, what we're going to do, first of all, well, let's just talk about two given experiments. This is from the book. And think about what our experimental variables are and talk a little bit about why experiments give us a stronger causal claim than a multiple regression. The new language that's going to come in to this chapter is independent groups design and within groups design. And this is a fancy way of saying, in the independent groups design, I'm going to have different people in different experimental conditions. I might, for example, have men in one group and women in another. Or I might have people who do receive a medication and people who receive a placebo. And in within groups designs, I have the same individuals that are exposed to the given levels of the variable. So I guess one of my claim to fame is living in Columbia, Missouri is I'm an old person. I don't have any health issues. So I'm always getting requests. Oh, you're an older white male and you're not diabetic and obese and you don't have arthritis. Great, can you come in and do our study? So the psychiatry department in the zoo asked me to come in and do a study for insomnia during the time of COVID. And evidently the experimental intervention is going to be play a video game. So I'm going to be really cool, just like you people. Play a video game, and this is supposed to help you sleep better at night. I'm very curious. Well, in this particular example, their design is they're going to take people. Some people will get treatment. Some people will get control. And if you're in the control group later on, in terms of beneficence, they're going to also have you do the experiment at a later point in time so that you get whatever benefits there are to treatment. The same connection, you know, so that's kind of a, a within group's design. I am exposed to the control group and I am exposed to the experimental group later on. 
when we're doing our COVID <laughs> clinical trials, you know, we have half the people get the placebo and half get the vaccine in order to find out if it's efficacious, if it's a good vaccine. Well, in the same fashion, later on, we expose people to the vaccine if they were in the placebo group. Well, in the case of vaccinating people or doing a therapy, we can't expose people to all levels of our treatment because after all, once you've been vaccinated, it's not gonna do you any good at all to come in and have a placebo shot. In other situations, it is possible for us to expose people to different levels of a variable for all people. So if I'm, for example, concerned about whether having a male interviewer interview children in a school or having a female interviewer interview children in a school, I can have children interviewed by a male and then later by a female. And then we'll talk about counterbalancing for others in our study. The, the female will be first followed by the male to control for order effects. So you know, the, we'll talk a little bit more about that at a later point in time. And then finally, when we have an experiment, how does life look a little bit differently when we're talking about what the validities are? So we have a bit of time. Let's talk about two simple examples. One, taking notes versus watching things on video, like you're doing now. And the second one is motivating babies to do some behavior that doesn't necessarily give you success right away as a function of watching people overcome obstacles. So this is an example talked about in the book. And what they had was, you know, this covered more in my notes here on the bottom. They had some people take notes on a laptop and they had some people do handwritten notes. And what they did was they showed people some TED Talks on material. And later on, they then did an assessment. How well can you score on some essay questions over what you've seen? And the conclusion of their study was, well, both groups seem to score about the same in terms of factual content, but those people who took notes on their laptops scored much lower on the conceptual questions of what you know, they really understood, and those people who took notes scored much better. Now, you know, reading a book like this experimental design book that you're all reading, it's a little bit like a mystery novel. There are themes that go out and come back in, and I hope it doesn't spoil things too much to say, you know, to spoil the mystery and say the butler did it. But this finding that actually, if you hand write notes, that you'll have much better conceptual understanding is a very controversial one. And, you know, we've talked about the replication crisis in psychology. This finding does not replicate well. And the picture is still very open as to whether your notes taken on a laptop are necessarily that much worse than sitting down with a paper and pencil and writing things out. It's rather ironic, just between you and me in our department, that you'll hear people say, oh, well, you, know, you should never ever allow laptops in a classroom because they're evil and bad because the study in our very experimental design book said they're bad. But the book itself later on talks about the fact that, you know, this, this doesn't really replicate. And this finding that we're talking about is a nice one to talk about experimental effects, but it doesn't really replicate. So, and that point is, you know, what I mentioned later on in 2019, you know, even the original researchers can't replicate this finding later on. But you know, the point is here, you know, in this design, it's, it's a between groups design. It's not a within groups design. They could have done it within groups design, but some people brought their laptops, the blue people, and some people took notes, the red folks, and we're looking at group differences here. And I'll have just enough time to talk about babies and then we'll probably have to put a pin in it for the day. So here's another study, and we have babies. 
Babies are a little bit like faculty members. They get easily bored and they're really hard to measure. In this particular case, what the researchers were interested in is if you see somebody else make an effort to do something, if the baby sees that, will the baby themselves actually be more motivated to try harder? So in this case, there were two experimental conditions. It's a between groups design. Some babies were assigned to the condition that the experimenter would come in and try to open a carabiner and you know, try to get a, a toy out of a box. And the person would apparently struggle to do that. And then afterwards, oh, yay, I did it. It's great. And they would then hand the baby a small box and have a little button on it. And it kind of looks as if this button, if you press it, should make music come out. Oh, it didn't actually. But what they assessed was how many times, how much did the baby interact with this little box and try to make it play music? In the second experimental condition, they were just, you know, the person did the toys, didn't make a big deal of it, and just handed the box to them and counted the number of times that the child tried to press the button. And what you see here on the right hand side is four babies who witnessed the experimenter open a carabiner or take a frog out of a toy box. The babies tended to press the button on the box a lot more than in those situations where there was no effort involved. So in terms of what we want you to be able to do, identify the independent and the dependent variables in this study. In the case of the note-taking example, well, I'm feeling needy. What do you folks think the independent and the dependent variables are in that study? Give me a chat. Or, the, or Kyle can talk. Yes. <laughs> the, and it would be um, note taking on paper versus computer, and dependent would be the um, actual or conceptual knowledge known. Yep. Excellent. And if we come downstairs and we're talking about the babies, anybody else want to try? Um, the independent variable would be the experimenter's interaction with the box, and then the dependent variable would be the baby's pressing the button. Pressing. Yep, yep. Excellent. Now, you might wonder if putting another variable in this model, in, in either of these experiments, could help your case. Because, for example, what if some babies just don't like to sit still? Or what if male babies are different than female babies? Would keeping track of the sex of the baby help you refine your estimate? If, for example, you know, at a very early age, women are just, you know, more dutiful. Women try harder than men. Maybe the number of button presses from the female babies will be larger than the number of male babies overall. So regardless of whether you're in the effort or the no effort condition, maybe the male babies are down here around 10 and the female babies are up here around 30 some odd. There's a lot of variation within each of these bars that's just due to the sex of the baby. Well, if I put that additional variable into my model and I adjust for sex of the baby, my error bars are going to be smaller because my statistical significance is a function of two things. It's a function of the mean level here and the amount of variation going on. So if I can adjust for sex, as I talked about in the last lecture, if I make error variables for the number of bar presses that are adjusted for sex, these error bars are going to get smaller. And, it, 
And in the same fashion, if I'm coming upstairs and looking at the taking of notes, maybe there are some characteristics of students that I might want to control for. You know, again, maybe the reading ability of people, the listening ability of people would help me understand what, you know, help me control for or minimize the variance in each of these groups. And that would give me some more statistical significance. So, you know, in other cases, control variables might actually be a third variable explanation. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. This is just kind of the first few slides of this PowerPoint. I see we're at time here today. I thank you. Give me some feedback at some point in time. Uh, and you know, as you're going through the chapters here and you're reading things and looking at the terms, hey, I'm here, I've got office hours right after this, and I'm also happy just to hang out and talk about things. So I'm getting lonely, even though I'm fully vaccinated now, okay? <laughs>